from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Elon Musk releases a cache of Twitter emails and documents relating to its censorship in 2020 of political content, in particular of the New York Post story on Hunter Biden's laptop and emails. What do these newly revealed documents tell us about Twitter's thinking at the time and, in particular, the coordination with the Biden campaign and the role of the Federal Bureau of Investigation? Plus, Donald Trump responds to that news by demanding that the Constitution be terminated. That's his word. We'll talk about that as well. Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo here with Kim Strassel and Kyle Peterson. Now, most of the press is ignoring the uh, Twitter censorship files, but uh, not us, and we want to talk about them. Now that he owns uh, Twitter, Elon Musk is cleaning out the censorship files. He dumped a number of revealing emails and documents late Friday on journalist Matt Taibbi's uh, Twitter feed. The documents reveal coordination with the Biden campaign to suppress certain Twitter feeds, including that of the actor James Woods. And they reveal how Twitter decided to suppress the New York Post story about Hunter Biden's laptop, claiming it might have been hacked or be Russian disinformation. First, Kim, why do you think Musk is going through Matt Taibbi here and not simply releasing everything all at one time so everyone can see and make their judgments about the news value? Well, I really wish he would. It struck me that what Musk wanted to do here was provide a sort of narrative. And so he chose a journalist who has been very critical of attempts to censor speech. And he had Matt Taibbi put this out in a string, a tweet string that attempted to kind of put the meat on the bones, as it were, and say, this is what was happening. And then this official weighed in and give names and try to provide some context. And so turn it a bit more into a story, albeit with snippets and certain links to documents. I think the problem with that is that, first of all, it's allowed the media to ignore this story to a certain degree because they claim that they can't confirm any of the arguments that Taibbi is making because the underlying documents aren't always there. I think it's also unfortunate in that it's cloaked other people's ability to sort of really see what was going on. And at a certain point, it would be good to just dump it all out there. It might be messy. There might be some confusion, but you'd probably end up with a lot more transparency and people would be more trusting of the argument that Musk is trying to make here. Right. I assume that if the House Republicans in the new Congress hold hearings, that they'll subpoena a whole heck of these documents and some of the individuals involved. Absolutely. And in putting this out there, and that's a very interesting point, Musk has essentially declared that an invitation almost to do that. It would be very difficult also not to say unlikely that the company would now fight such a subpoena, given that they've already authorized a certain amount of disclosure. We should add that Matt Taibbi is uh, hardly a uh, right-wing journalist. He's a real left-winger, in fact. But on the issue of censorship and the First Amendment, he's a hawk as much as we are. So in that sense, he's highly credible here, at least in, in my estimation on this subject. Kyle, you've looked at the documents and the, the flurry of coverage about them. So what do you take away from it? Well, the biggest takeaway for me is that this decision by Twitter to ban the New York Post story on Hunter Biden's laptop was basically them making it up as they went. One thing that I think is notable, this is from Matt Taibbi. He says, several sources recalled hearing about a general warning from federal law enforcement that summer about possible foreign hacks. There's no evidence that I've seen of any government involvement in the laptop story. And so I think that is a notable piece here. But it does seem like they hadn't really thought all this through. There's some internal emails where Twitter officials are saying they're struggling to understand the policy basis for marking this as unsafe. There's some suggestion that this did not even get all the way up to Jack Dorsey. It was made by... Who was the former CEO of the time he was CEO of Twitter. Correct. And so it seems like they didn't really have their ducks in a row, that they were worried about Russian disinformation, and they made the bad call, I think, to ban the New York Post story. The thing that I think we're still waiting for is evidence of real government involvement and coercion on these social media sites. I mean, earlier this year, this fall, I looked at a bunch bunch of emails, hundreds of pages of emails between federal officials and Twitter and Facebook. These emails involved, for example, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And so there were emails to Twitter flagging things as COVID disinformation, things like vaccines have microchips in them. 
There were emails going the other direction where the CDC was asking, we're seeing this claim surfacing a lot. Do you have any information about whether it's true or not? And so I think the smoking gun would be something where there's a federal official making some sort of implied threat if Facebook or Twitter doesn't act the way that the government wants them to. And and that is what I think we're still waiting to find out. Well, that's the fascinating subject here, because uh, as a private entity, Twitter has the ability to censor what it wants. It's not uh, governed by the First Amendment per se. That controls that the government can do. But there is some case law and a couple of Supreme Court precedents that if a private entity is acting essentially as an enforcer for the government, then therefore it could bring First Amendment implications. And that some of the coordination with the Biden campaign that we've seen in these some of these emails suggests a voluntary cooperation by Twitter. On the other hand, remember, this is an administration. It was a campaign and they could have won the election and then If you're sitting there as a private person working for Twitter and you say, I'm sorry, we can't do that, we're going to keep James Woods on, we're going to keep the New York Post on, then do you fear retribution, Kim? And I think that's a very realistic question to pose. Yeah, absolutely. I take a little bit different view of this. I think the story here, one of the biggest stories is not just the very shoddy reasons that Twitter used to decide that they were going to shut this story down. But indeed, the communications that it was having with exceptionally powerful political figures, people who, even if they didn't immediately hold office, very likely had the prospect of holding office and therefore the ability to take retribution and action against Twitter if it didn't do what they said. And what really jumps out in these Twitter files is the direct lines of communication that these political figures had to senior Twitter officials and the ease with which they had their demands satisfied. Literally, there's one where a request comes through to someone that says, here's five more links from the Biden campaign. And the response from someone at Twitter is handled, meaning those Those people were all censored, essentially, at the request of senior people in a major presidential political campaign. And this gets to what you're saying, Paul, is that, yes, Twitter is a private entity, and I definitely believe that it has uh, rights to make its own decisions about what it does or doesn't. But you would feel a lot more comfortable if its attitude was hostility toward any government actor that was asking it to censor something. Then you might feel a little bit more confident in the decisions it made. But that is not the situation here. This is a a sort of two-way avenue here where there is lots of cooperation going on. A lot of it seems to be favoring one side of the aisle. And the implicit threat, of course, the leverage the government would have over a platform like Twitter is the existence of Section 230, which allows as a federal a statute which gives the social media sites a liability protection from lawsuits if they do exercise their discretion to edit or to to censor. And of course, that's in many respects a good thing when it comes to child pornography, when it comes to inciting terrorism or violence. But when it becomes a justification for banning uh, news stories at a major newspaper like the New York Post, that becomes a different thing. And we should add that the New York Post hasn't been entirely vindicated as a factual matter here. The Hunter Biden emails and the laptop were real, and the Post was entirely correct in posting them. And the fears that they were somehow Russian disinformation have proven to be false at the time. Now, one interesting point, uh, Ro Khanna, the congressman, a progressive Democrat from California, is in one of the documents uh, suggesting a caution to the uh, chief Twitter censor saying to her that, you know, this is getting quite a bit of backlash here, <laughs> Kyle, from uh, the press. you got to be careful because this has First Amendment implications. So Kana, to me, looks like the stand-up guy here and the Twitter folks uh, not nearly as uh, principled. I agree with that. I mean, the other point that Ro Khanna made was that we're talking about a newspaper article here. His line was restricting dissemination of newspaper articles in the heat of a presidential campaign will invite more backlash then it will do good. And I think that's true. The other caution I would add, though, is that I'm not surprised to see press secretaries emailing Twitter and flagging posts that they think should be taken down. And the difficulty is that a lot of this stuff really runs the gamut. 
So one of the posts that was allegedly flagged here by the DNC, according to these emails, if you go back and look at it, it appears to have include a nude photo of Hunter Biden. And it's blurred a little bit, but it really should be blurred a whole lot more. And so that's something that Twitter, even if it were not a politician's son, would probably have taken down under its policy against non-consensual nudity. And so I think the details really matter here, A, on what the posts were that were being asked to take down, what the response rate was from Twitter. I mean, there's no evidence that we're still waiting on evidence, I guess, to see if there are examples of where Twitter left things up that were being flagged. And then I would also add that Matt Taibbi also says that both parties had access to these tools in 2020 requests from both the Trump White House and the Biden campaign were received and honored. And so that suggests to me that it's kind of a complicated story. And there may be instances where Democrats are having an easier time getting these takedown requests looked at, in part because the Twitter office is full of fellow Democrats. But it does look like it's a complicated story. Both sides were doing this. And and if you have a professional press secretary, I would be surprised if they weren't.